A warm welcome to one and all. Myself Kunal Chawda and my colleague Sally Pawaska from second year B R students of Shrimati K L Tiwari College of Architecture take this opportunity to introduce you to our organization and institution. I now hand it over to Sally to introduce to our organization. Our education, the parent organization covering a registered educational society, is a reputed quality education provider. It comprises of fifty-two institutions spread across the Thane and Palghar districts of Maharashtra, Pune, and Chandigarh district of Uttar Pradesh. Ever since the commencement of its first school in Bandar in the year nineteen ninety-two, by our honourable chairman, Sir Sri Lalan Tiwari ji. Rahul Education has diligently followed the path of delivering 360 degree quality education. Rahul Education is already providing education in all streams of engineering, polytechnic, architecture, design studies, law, and degree courses in hotel management, master of education, bachelor of education, and many other streams, and also the junior colleges. Many. Rahul Education, Sri Mati K L Tiwari College of Architecture, situated in Mira Road, was established in 2016 under the eminent leadership of Group Secretary Sri Rahul L Tiwari Sir and Joint Secretary Madam Sri Mati Krishna Tiwari. This institute has spread its wing in architecture education. Eskertikoe, along with its team of expert faculty, follows an experiential learning philosophy. And has been collaborating with the architecture firms, experts, and scholars to give an holistic educational learning to its students. Our talk series, Rubaru, explores various aspects of architectural subject through critical conscious learning and fact finding methodology. Rahul Education has decided to open our 2021 Rubaru session on an online platform for the benefit of all students from. Other institutions too, and I'm pretty sure that it will be a passionate and thrilling ride of historic session, getting you all to travel you to our old historic time virtually. So, without any further wait, let's get to know to our today's speaker of the session, which will be introduced by the Kuna. So let us begin with our session today on the subject of humanities. Topic: Byzantine Era. Speaker for the day is Professor Rupali H. Gupte, the principal of Shrimati K. L. Tiwari College of Architecture. She is an architect, researcher, and an academician with a postgraduate degree in project management. She is pursuing her PhD in architectural education. We have enjoyed learning in-house sessions with Rupali, ma'am. and we are extremely keen and eagerly awaiting to have one and another interesting session humanities with her after this session we will have a separate q and a time for you all so that you can ask your questions and queries amidst or after speech in the chat box and now we shall welcome you architect rupali gupte ma'am and request you to begin with our first talk series of rubaru hello uh, that was a very warm welcome my dear students kunal and saili thank you very much uh, we are floating uh, our session here on an online platform and we are really grateful to rahul education for giving us this opportunity uh, i hope we make the most of it and we enjoy this session to the fullest okay so let's begin uh rubaru talk series uh, is a series which takes you through different allied fields of architecture where experts talk about uh, uh, their niche areas and something beyond the books something beyond uh, uh, the knowledge that is written in books is shared and enjoyed okay. so we are beginning today with the byzantine era the byzantine era is uh, is one of uh, the imperial eras 
but sadly it is also combined with the dark ages of the roman empire now when we see a beautiful monument like this in the picture in front of you why do you think it should be a dark age right so let's see before we begin with byzantine era we have to understand how this era came into picture what was the storyline behind formulating this era so i will give you a a quick briefing about the classical age we know the egyptian age the mesopotamian age which are the ancient civilizations okay after the prehistoric civilizations then comes the classical era the classical era is an era where you have the greek and roman architecture flourishing so all of you have seen the greek and roman architecture you are seeing uh, the columns and uh, and the capitals of the columns put up everywhere and you realize that yes this is some sort of an western architecture so uh, though we have gone through the greek and roman era it becomes very important for us to take a quick glimpse of these eras before we move to the byzantine era okay so let us understand the slide um, uh, ad bc um, details okay uh, we see here there is prehistoric age there is ancient age there is medieval there is early modern and there is modern okay now many times when you read you see that it is bc or ad or ce so what is all this uh, i'll just give you a clear clarity in that first of all we look at the ancient classical ages which are greek and roman okay we look at the medieval ages which comes after the classical ages that are called the dark ages which has byzantine and ottoman then comes the early modern age gothic romanesque renaissance most of our fort of mumbai fort area of mumbai the south mumbai that we call is all made up of gothic and Rom romanesque and renaissance structures but at the same time there are uh, the byzantine and ottoman uh, glimpses also believe me byzantine was an equally robust empire as good as gothic and romans fine so what is bc bc stands for before christ now the interesting part is in the entire timeline the year the day when jesus christ was born was considered the zero year Okay. so everything before the birth of christ is termed as bc and everything after the birth of christ is ad ad's full form in latin is anno domini that means it is the this uh, it is the current year the the year of the lord the year of the lord so there was this georgian uh, calendar Uh, which came up and there were these believers in christianity the christian community who were looking at um, uh, ad you know which was having a very strong religious uh, concept to it eventually what happened there were people who were not believing in in uh, god or one god they were not believing in religion so so somewhere there was a, a a not a satisfying acceptance for ad or bc so when we say that we are not believing in christ we are not believing in god we are not believing in one god philosophy why should we write as bc or ad and then came a similar pattern which is ce which means the common era okay so uh, bc um and ad and ce are just different names so bc stands for before christ ad stands for anno domini ce means the common era okay the common era uh, which which will be the uh, the current era and bce is the before common era so if we don't use bc ad we use ce or bce with this uh if still there is a confusion we will just see that uh if we have to say 2021 year we will say ad 2021 it will mean 2021 years after jesus christ was born okay so this is what it means so other terminology used is bce or ce so for bce becomes before christ so for us it will be 2021 ce that is the common era 
Okay. Now, if you see an important thing where this is written is that CE is written after 2021 and AD is written before 2021. So this is a terminology which, uh, which is followed, you know, which is followed to um, write AD and CE. So uh, this is all what I told about why AD, why CE and BCE came into picture because we they didn't have to say AD as the year of the Lord because they didn't believe in Lord, and so it was CE. Okay. Fine. So the first ancient classical age is the Greek architecture. Uh, we all know about the Parthenon. We all know about what Greeks have given us. So we will just move ahead. Why I'm showing you this is I'm trying to tell you the. Um, uh, what you call the the exclusiveness of architecture and the empire that was per that was pers persisting there at that time. So we saw the Greek. This is Acropolis. So uh, uh, all Greek uh, states had uh, a small center which is called as the Acropolis, which was usually on a hillock and which had all the main structures of of their temples and you know other uh, important things and this acropolis formed the main so what you see on the hillock is the acropolis and then the city spreads down niche hillock may the the other city that you see is uh, is the entire city of greece so we know that there were amphitheaters we know that there were temples we know that there were these famous columns of gothic ionic and corinthian i'm not going into those details but this is what greek greece was then we come to Roman. Now we are going to look at Roman a little bit uh, in detail because Roman gave birth to Byzantine. How? We will see that. Okay. You all know this. It is Colosseum. You know? So we all know Colosseum. We know the grandeur of Colosseum. And we know that uh, it is one of the marvel of classical Roman era. So not only Colosseum, there were huge aqueducts which used to take the water just imagine the uh, uh, the mind the geniusness of the people of the romans that they knew that see earlier all civilizations were ne near the lake okay, near the water body and because of these rivers the civilization flourished because they needed water so eventually canals were dug, but still they couldn't move more. They couldn't move their province more because they couldn't take water from one mountain to the other mountain. But here the Romans created these huge aqueducts. So arches were invented when we see the architectural uh, marvel and innovation. And they realized that these arches could go huge, tall, as tall as the mountains. And they found this technology of, of making arches and there were pipes taken at different levels from one point to the other. Normally they were the lead pipes through which the water was taken. Now lead pipes also can lead to poisoning, lead poisoning. So there was a very smart innovative technology of, of how it should be prevented, what coating should be given to the lead pipe so that the water doesn't get contaminated or poisoned. Believe me, Romans were Mm, uh, were exploring on all phases of physics, chemistry, maths, astronomy, astrology, architecture, everywhere they were gaining uh, knowledge and immense knowledge. Okay? So after aqueducts, what we see is uh, the Pantheon. Yes, it, though it looks, it looks very, uh, you know, out of color, but it was a marvel. Do you see the Pantheon dome? Just, just take this into picture. Just remember this Pantheon dome, because uh, after arches, it was the dome that was the first innovation that came into architecture. And we are going to talk about domes in Byzantine era. So this is important. Okay? So this is Pantheon. The interiors of Pantheon, Jitna Bahar se we felt it is it is slightly dull, it is slightly look look at inside. It has all, all marbles and it has an oculus on the top. Oculus was the opening through which the light used to enter. And uh, so what happened about the rain? Yes, the water also used to fall, but then there were systems in the floor where the water could be percolated and taken through drains outside. So again, uh, services and uh, construction was at its peak. The coffer, the dome had coffers, you know? So this is, the, this is a new technique of constructing the dome which makes it look, look lighter. But nevertheless, they couldn't still achieve the lightness in this dome. 
Now, this dome was so flat, you know, to be seen. From inside, it doesn't look flat. But from outside, it looks flat because they didn't know the technique of constructing thinner walls to support the dome. The walls in Pantheon were around 10 feet wide, thick. Can you imagine? 10 feet thick is, is like one room size. This thick are these walls, the round walls which are beneath the dome are that thick because only through those walls they could construct the dome. Otherwise, they didn't know they, the technique was not innovated as yet. Okay. So the domes had coffers where it looked better from inside, and then there were niches and decorations done on the wall because the wall was thick, so they could decorate it. These were the entrance gates. So whenever the Roman Empire used to win a war, there were these welcoming gates, uh, which were called as the triumphant arches in triumph, in victory. And when the whole battalion, battalion used to come after winning a war, they used to enter through these gates. And these gates had all drawings and uh, you know, carvings of, of the story of their, uh, of their fight that they had they have conducted. And this is the entire city of Rome. Now, if you see, you see a small orange colored wall in, in the city. Now, we will talk of that later on, but don't miss this wall. Remember this wall. So when you see this oval shaped, round shaped, it is the Pantheon, then uh, it is the Colosseum and you see all other structures. So Rome was a flourishing city. You won't believe jo Aj, today what we see as spas and gymnasiums and health clubs. Uh, and uh, open air theaters and party spaces, everything was there in Rome. They had spas, they had um, uh, bar, uh, open, uh, uh, you know, they had gyms, they had open areas, they had marketplaces as good as malls. And they had, they had huge planning system when it comes to architecture. Then what happened? So we are seeing this Till now, what we saw was the Roman imperialism. Okay? Imperialism is the highest peak of Roman Empire. The imperial, the, 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 the king size lifestyle. Okay? And this was called as the golden period of Rome. So Rome was formed in 27 BC before Christ and it went to 180 AD. So after Christ was born, 180 years. 27 BC to 180 AD. So this is called as the golden period. Why it is called as golden period is because abhi tak jo humne dekha, whatever slides we saw right now are all the epitome of the Roman Empire. Okay? And there were these five emperors, which is called as the golden period of the five emperors. So the Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, and Marcus Aurelius. So these were the five emperors who made Rome or made Rome see the golden period, the golden period of Rome. Okay. And it was called as the Pax Romana. So this, this packet of years of golden years were called as the Pax Romana, which gave immense luxury, immense prosperity, freedom to, uh, of, of, and stability to Rome and which went on for around 200 years. So a, a very, very huge and long period of 200 years. Okay? And here is one word which I, I wanted you to mention is uh, to, to learn is the hegemonial power. What do you mean by hegemony? So it is like one powerful state which takes care of all the other small states. One, one uh, authority. It's like the central power which decides on all the political, economical, military predominances. Yes, so it is called as the hegemonic power. So this is, this is what Roman imperialism was. Okay. Now, I would like to show you a video over here, which is of uh, the Roman imperialism era, an era where Rome was, um, was the highest. Rome was a period of epitome. And we are seeing, we are watching a small video clip of a gladiator movie. I don't know whether you have seen Gladiator, but um, I would just uh, uh, request Kunal to and Madhura to just arrange for the video. Till then, I'll just give you a briefing about it. Okay, so uh, 
द लास्ट एम्पर फाइव एम्पर में से द लास्ट एम्पर विच आई है मार्कस ओरेलियस सो मार्कस ओरेलियस हैड टू किड्स वन वॉज लुसीला एंड द अदर किंग हु वॉज शोन एज कोमोडस हु वॉज शोन एज द किंग इन ग्लैडिएटर ओके एंड दे हैड अ the fight of the king uh, with the um, with the other king which was maximus you okay, know maximus uh, it is the story goes this way that marcus aurelius was a very uh, was a very just king who ruled rome uh, very nicely definitely it was the golden period of rome and then it was um, uh, his daughter lucilla and commodius but commodius was was not a very just king and he killed uh, his father he smothered him he killed him and he took the rule and that was the time when maximus who was um, the emperor of of some states of the roman empire uh, was captured by uh, commodus and um, he was uh, made a slave okay now these slaves were all caught and were taken to um, different uh, uh, work uh, areas but the major uh, fun loving aspect of the roman imperialism was the colosseum and the fights so they were taken to colosseum and they were uh, kept there in the cell and there used to be real fights between men and animals and these men who used to fight were the uh, were were the slaves who were caught now why i'm showing you this is that this story this this documentary is about uh, not a documentary sorry the video clip of the movie gladiator is about um, maximus fighting in the arena of colosseum uh, colosseum and there is lucilla and there is commodus who is sitting as the king but what i want to see is definitely the fight will be very empowering but i want you to see the vastness of colosseum there are certain long shots that are taken uh, in the video and we can see how the colosseum was spread now uh, before we see we'll just see a small section of the colosseum this colosseum here what you see which you see at the farthest end samne ekdam you see a platform okay that is an entire ground that ground comes right till the front and here down that you see these small 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 cells these are actually the cells where the animals and the slaves were kept so there was a ram there were lifts Uh, and the rams which used to take the animals through the rams and they used to come out uh, on the ground the the ground was covered with sand why because during the fights when there was bloodshed it could be covered by sand okay so this was the actual colosseum and this is another view of the colosseum so we are seeing the colosseum without the floor so it already rises four floors and plus underground it was another Three to four floors. So just imagine the construction technology that must have, uh, you know, that had uh, happened when uh, the, uh, you know, the Colosseum was built. Okay. So each each of this structure is a fabulous way of uh, showing the marvel of architecture, which and has in detail analysis of how it was constructed. of course we are not seeing that today but we will see this short video and then we will move further which is the base of today's session so um, can somebody help us with the video yes sir can i share my screen now yeah sure should i st i should stop the screening right yes ma'am stop share ma'am is my screen visible yes
Ma'am, is the audio is uh, uh, is the audio clear? Uh, just play. We are not able to hear the audio as such. No, we are not able to hear the audio. Now, ma'am? No, I don't think so. Volume is full. Okay, no problem. You are able to hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'll just give a, a small, to be better if the video is off so that I can just tell you. So this is, he is Maximus, okay, here who is fighting. And uh, this is the sand that I have been told, telling you that how uh, it was covered with sand. Okay, and you see the Colosseum, the, the entry of Maximus. Uh, yeah, you keep playing. Yeah, so the entry of Maximus is, this is for uh, Commodius and Lucilla. Okay. And just see the huge arena of uh, Colosseum that was seen. What I want you to see here is basically um, the slaves. Even just notice the slaves. None of them are other than Maximus. Maximus is the only Roman person. But majority of others, if you see, are of different tribes. You will see some from South Africa. You will see some from the Huns. Now, see, these people who are coming are the Africans. Okay. Now, they are lifting up uh, uh, the floor. Yeah. Gate. And then from beneath the floor gate, you would see a tiger coming up. Right? So this was, this was the technology from where the tigers used to come up. And they used to enjoy these live diehard games. Look at the Colosseum and look at the, the way it is constructed. It was constructed in hierarchy where uh, the kings used to sit in the front, the uh, nobles behind them. And as per the hierarchy till the lower man, uh, it used to move. Okay? So the lowermost floor of this Colosseum where you can see those uh, gates, Jali gates, uh, those were where the slaves were kept and all the floors beneath also there was Rome. It was something wherein they had so much of money, so much of power, and so much of luxury that there was nobody who could stop them. Always remember, students, that when there is there is an epitome of uh, of certain luxuries that you get, it is very important to form a balance, especially for the ruling kingdoms and the ones who are in the authority. The minute you feel that there is nobody who can stop us now. The minute you feel that there is nobody who can, uh, who will be able to overrule us is where the problem starts. And when this was imperial, the most highest golden age of Rome, Commodius era saw the downfall of Rome. Okay. And now, what we will see is that how uh, the downfall of Rome began. Uh, so I think we can stop the video.
Okay, you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes, great. Okay, so this is what uh, Rome was when there it was the epitome or the highest peak of Rome. And then what we are going to see now is the fall of Rome. So what we see in the fall of Rome is that after Pax Romana, there was trade happening, right? But just imagine people were dying with love. They were so, so filthy rich that they started buying things. There was a lot of money that they were uh, getting. The slaves that were, you see, when you have a lot of, a lot of luxury at your feet, you tend to be lazy. You tend to be you know, not uh, uh, looking at or not trying to uh, do any work. And this happened in all areas of Rome. What happened was majorly Rome was, uh, the military of Rome was started being given to the slaves. Means the soldiers who were fighting the wars were were less of the Roman civilization, but more of the slaves whom the Romans had captured. They, the Romans, in fact, started trading, but they started trading in buying more goods rather than producing it. As a result, they started growing in debt and they started relying humongously on the slave labor. Fine. Now, this was the time when there was uh, Emperor Diocletian. Now, Diocletian, what did he do? He divided the Roman Empire into two halves, the Eastern and Western. So, this is the wall that he built, dividing the two empires. Okay. Now, if you see, this is the entire Rome, the orange color is the entire Rome during uh, the Pax Romana area, okay, Pax Romana time. But now it had been divided. The green part that you see is the uh, Eastern Rome and the red part that you see is the Western Rome, okay. So we, we see the Western Empire and the Eastern. So the Western Empire usually had the city of Milan. Now what happened was, we will see the uh, Western Empire. Okay? If you see, there is, there is the Mediterranean Sea in the center okay? and there is the Black Sea, uh, the Mediterranean Sea in the center and the Black Sea uh, above it. Right? Right? So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So now these, these Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, if you see, these were the areas of uh, uh, where the tribals, that is the Huns, the Goths, uh, the barbarians um, started attacking. And especially Western emperor, you know, who was, uh, who was the Maximian uh, and the um, Diocletian both took different regions to rule. So Maximian was on the Western Front and uh, Diocletian was on the Eastern Front. But Maximian could not control the Western Front at all. There was a lot of corruption. There was a lot of giving the power to the slaves to fight because of which there were revolts. The slaves were not ready to fight. The slaves were not. And then when the tribes used to attack them, they were short of the military support especially the Western Empire, right? And by AD 456, the barbarians had completely conquered Western Roman Empire. So the Western Roman Empire fell into the dark ages from 500 to 1300 AD. Just imagine how many years, around seven to 800 years, the Western Roman Empire was under dark ages. So this, same Rome, which we saw in Gladiator, the pompousness of that was totally devastated, absolutely devastated. The, the structures which are now uh, seen in ruins is 
the impact of dark ages because otherwise uh, there was no uh, question of uh, that there, there were the structures which stayed for years together for for, for ages till today so uh, these fights from uh, the tribals the huns the goths the germanic tribes the barbarians led to the end of western empire which is coined as the dark ages but what happened to the medieval ages yes, these are the part of medieval ages when western empire goes into the dark ages what happens to the eastern empire now eastern empire also started in 330 ad and it was robustly uh, working well for around 1000 years till 1453 ad so under he, under their two very strong emperors the constantine and justinian his son justinian so these two emperors built the eastern part of rome very very strongly they built their capital city in constantinople so constantine was the one who built the capital city and it was named after this king the emperor constantine which was called as constantinople which was the capital city and what was eastern roman empire known as it was known as the byzantine empire okay so this is where we start actually with the byzantine era so constantinople naturally was a wealthy trade city if you see this plan you know uh, byzant uh, constantinople comes somewhere in the center where it is written where the home of galerius diocletian caesar is written somewhere in that part comes constantinople so it had a very good trade between the black sea as well as the mediterranean sea and they made maximum uh, um, you know benefit of that a very positive benefit and now starts in the issue so now everything what you are learning in architecture is the medieval period which is the eastern part of rome but before we start with this eastern part of rome we also should know that what were the religions what were the following because if it is byzantine then what is it that they follow even though it was called as byzantine it is still known as the uh, uh, as the eastern roman empire so there were the romans who were still there so they still followed uh, the roman traditions okay and this byzantine empire was uh, also then started constructing its marvels so this photograph that you have continuously been seeing is of hagia sophia now hagia sophia is what is a church so you should understand that when we are looking at we have come to ad means christ was born and there was christianity that was being followed so there was a very strong religion of christianity which was seen in the byzantine empire okay now this is a star uh, demarcation of the roman empire that is the eastern roman empire which is called as the byzantine empire and the western roman empire okay uh in the rule of constantine they followed the greco roman culture greco roman culture is that is a mix of greek and roman so when we say they follow the greco roman culture normally the gods the uh, the worshiping is all done even the architectural elements the columns the the pedantry and everything are uh, the greek style okay there were schools um uh, there was uh, there were health centers there was learning in grammar and geometry okay? roman style architecture was seen so arches and domes were constructed fine right? now after uh 50 years basically so after uh, the fall of rome uh and the rule of constantine which was for another 50 years came the rule of the byzantine emperor justinian okay now justinian not only ruled well but he also conquered many other territories of the roman era so now if you see that the orange part which is the rome which is the byzantine empire uh, the dark orange the yellow part uh, the dark orange or the darkish pink color whichever you are seeing and the lighter orange orangeish color is the countries of 
Western Roman Empire, which he conquered, okay, with Justinian capture. Okay. He did. He uh, he was supposed to be a very significant ruler. Okay. Then he expanded his military. That's why he could conquer so many other uh, areas of uh, Western Roman Empire. Also, uh, he generated a Roman legal code. So there was a rule. There was a law that was made. and this law was so strongly made for all levels of criminal justice marriage property slavery even women's rights for that matter that it was considered strong for the next 900 years okay? and constantine was the king who actually built the church of hagia sophia but uh, uh, justinian also renovated it and maintained it well now Be, uh, before we move to hagia sophia we have to understand what is the uh, what is the uh, christian uh, religion um, issues that uh, you know you are you are able to that that these people were facing so you are seeing a very robust way of byzantine empire coming up but were there any issues still okay uh, we can't say an issue but we can say a very staunch belief in the rise of christianity so constantine was the one who believed in christianity very very strongly the entire roman empire eastern and western all believed in christianity but but there was a difference so you would say what is the difference in in the in the believing of christianity we will see that now what happened was the western europe and the yes eastern europe that is the byzantine though they followed christian religion but in the western europe they kept a highest authority which was the pope okay after the pope were the uh, arch bishops and the bishops so the arch bishops and bishops in the hierarchy used to look at the different regions and the priests were looking at the churches but pope was given the highest authority even higher to the king whereas in eastern europe the emperor was almighty he was not uh, the rule was not given to the pope though they followed christianity but when it was the male ruler whose whose uh, decision was followed this male ruler uh, is termed as the patriarch so it was the patriarch when there is a a male dominated society it becomes the patriarch now there is a very interesting book by uh, uh, book on uh, this system of christianity and i have written over here discuss pagan system so pagan system was a system which was the early very very early uh, systems of religion which believed in in women empowerment which believed in the goddess the power of goddess of goddesses okay but when it came to jesus christ then it was the male idol which was worshiped and the female took a back seat okay so there is a book by dan brown which is called the da vinci code and it is a book on leonardo da vinci which we all whom we all know uh, as a multi uh, talented person and leonardo da vinci uh, was the one who was you know who is who uh, was supposed to be following the uh, pagan system so uh, this if you read this book you might come to know what a pagan system was it's a very interesting way to understand and how the women empowering pagan system was completely diminished after the patriarchy how it was it was totally wiped out how christian religion supported uh, uh the the man rule the idol rule and how everybody was focused including the churches used to guide them to focus on the uh, jesus christ or the male dominated uh, rule very interesting we will see that it is not something which was seen as a history even today when the authority is in in the highest uh, rulers of a country 
it becomes it becomes uh, you know it gives them power to divert the public wherever and however they want to so it is a very important way to understand and that is why uh, you know the people who were not believing in christianity didn't have a survival mode at all so if they had to believe if they have to had to be a part of all the luxury all the things and then they had to fall or believe the, uh, the the believe in the christian religion so now because there were these two stark differences that one believed pope one did not believe pope so when justinian started conquering the western uh, regions and started taking them under his reign then there was a revolt from them because the people over there were not ready to accept the king as the king they were though they were following christianity they wanted to follow their systems of what a pope uh, is supposed to be the higher authority in that way okay and these disagreements led to deep division among the christians so the christians being one community we can see a great division among the christians where the western europe followed the roman catholic church philosophy and the eastern europe that is the byzantine followed the eastern orthodox church the ones who are christians will come to know so many times they say that we are uh, the roman catholics we are uh, from the orthodox church so this is how it had percolated there that time during the byzantine era okay now we will come to the architectural marvel of hagia sophia so hagia sophia um, is the church of uh, byzantine architecture the magnificent church that was constructed uh, by constantine and finally renovated by uh, justinian now if you see this church you would see the central dome if you remember the previous central dome of the pantheon it was not that tall or it was not coming out right it was flatter we couldn't see the dome properly so now why do you think we are able to see the dome here i i don't know if we would be able to discuss here on this but because this dome has been given a base can you see a a base circular base with so many windows that are seen on the uh, beneath the dome right so this was the innovation that was done for the dome in byzantine era also there is another innovation which is called as the produce you see that there are uh, the walls are definitely thick but still uh, the dome doesn't rest uh, on the wall directly so the walls are slightly thinner as compared to the uh, to what was there that time because there was a different technology used for constructing of this dome we will see what it is okay this is the interior of hagia sophia do you see the uh, uh, muslim symbols that are put up over here so uh, we will come to that we will come to this uh, this muslim symbols that are seen because hagia sophia was later converted to a mosque though it was a church first it was later on uh, converted to the mosque when the ottoman empire took over it so for around uh, 1000 1500 years when um, the byzantine empire ruled it was it fell by it fell to the ottoman empire now the meaning of hagia sophia is holy wisdom okay and uh, currently byzantine uh, that is your it is in constantinople and that is the current istanbul turkey okay now this is what we are talking of is the 6th century ad structure it contains two floors centered on a giant nave now what is a nave uh, i will i will now explain you the architectural construction of this dome i hope i am able to um, explain you through this slide because normally i draw sketches on the board and i you know show models to explain but let's see how easy i can make it for you 
understand one thing the the circular windows that are seen over here at the base okay these circular windows are are 40 in number okay and this is what was forming the base of the dome so this is the main dome of the windows the domes which you are seeing exactly in the front which is looking in the slightly orange color and which looks like a half dome exactly front wall okay there were two half domes on the opposite side of the central dome let us see in plan or i would first show you in the section possible so this is a section which is cut vertically uh, of that entire uh, hagia sophia you see the dome you see the windows which is forming the base which is a ring of 40 windows right and beneath this dome on the left and right side are half domes that are coming down right now these half domes are not seen in the photograph of hagia sophia we will again go to the hagia sophia see here we are not able to see the half domes we are able to see only the main dome that is because the half domes are covered by the thickness of the wall if you would have taken a different angular photograph possibly we would have been able to see these half domes okay now the central part of the dome so basically the central part of the uh, the church is square where there is a, the central part where it is written nave n a v e the central part is called the nave the circle around the nave is the about dome circle it is not there on the floor it is on the ceiling okay and the two uh, parallel lines that are seen or the square that is seen is actually the plan of uh, this church and then there are these two half domes on the left and right side okay there is a small on the extreme left side there is a small protrusion which is the apse so apse is a niche where the idol used to be kept and on the extreme right is the entrance so this entrance had two verandas uh, a porticos type of entrances which were called as the narthex okay which were called as the narthex so nave apse narthex narthex was the entrance portico then you enter the main temple center of the temple which is the nave and you see the dt the idol which is kept in the apse now besides uh, uh, the uppermost and the lowermost part of the nave you will see corridors again these corridors were called as the aisles okay so if you see the plan of the temple is slightly squarish right it is it is the form of a cross but a slightly squarish cross as you move ahead when we go to gothic and renaissance and as christianity progresses then the the plan of the church became a longer cross so one um, part of the cross was longer but in byzantine it was a squarish uh, plan as you see over here okay here i have word, there is there is a definition of uh, that how much is the uh, nave measuring okay then it is covered by a central dome and it is 55.6 so above floor level from the floor till the top of the dome is almost 182 feet 182 feet becomes uh, around 18 floors right because uh, if you see 10 feet if we consider the height of one floor okay then it is around 100 uh, around 18 floors so it's a 18 to 20 storage structure that was constructed no doubt it looks so massive okay so it was it, it made one of the largest in the world the dome that was constructed was one of the largest and it was a marvel now this huge dome couldn't be constructed uh, till the classical rome तो इन्होंने क्या किया वॉट वॉज स्पेसिफिक दैट यू वुड सी इन दिस डोम इफ यू सी द डार्क ब्लैक कलर्ड 
shaded areas are the walls okay but here you will see very minimal shaded areas just beside the four uh, column like uh, shaded areas that are on four sides of the nave you don't see any other thicker wall only these are there now here they learned the technique of bringing the load of the dome to different elements in the pantheon in the in the roman early classical roman era the dome was the load of the dome was taken directly by the wall and that is why they had to construct this 10 10 feet thick walls of at least one room size thick walls around uh, uh, the dome but here you don't see any walls right you are just seeing when you say there is a wall then it is shaded so when you see this four corners of the nave shaded means there were only four uh, supports that were given to the dome so how did the dome sit on these let us see that. okay and that is why uh, because there are no walls surrounding the dome you would see that it is a free open hall there are no columns in between right it is a free open hall and there are aisles on either sides if we are not able to see the aisles in this photograph uh, on the left and right the gray colored arches that you see on the ground floor besides us arches ke piche behind those arches are the aisles Okay. and this uh, decorative wall or we can say openings which is given is very thin it is not as thick as 10 feet or 15 feet as it was there in um, the pantheon okay so this is a little uh, image which would you would be able to understand so this is the dome which is cut okay uh, though there is a square base for the dome the square walls are not going inside instead there are these arches that are constructed on all four sides and there are these half domes and further the entire narthex which i said narthex was the entrance portico the narthex and the apse which is at which was behind are further covered with small small domes and you know uh, semi circular ceilings which gives it a very beautiful look so now we will understand how the load is transferred okay. this is the dome uh, that is that you can see uh, if you see the red line coming down okay, they realized that the load of the dome is transferred on the ring and from the ring it can be transferred only at four corners but how will it get transferred on the four corners if the corners have pendentives what is a pendentive this triangular portion that is formed the red triangular portion between the circle and the straight line which is formed is called the pendentive and they uh, evolved they innovated that if we construct only four supports instead of a wall on all four sides if we just construct four supports and take those supports till the base of the dome in the form of pendentives and open up the walls of four sides in arches then there is no need because they realize the load is not transferred on the wall in fact it is transferred from the corners of the pendentives believe me students this was one of the highest innovations that made all other innovations that you see you know in in romanesque architecture in renaissance those huge pointed arches and huge uh, openings possible this theory of pendentives 
So if you see this small sketch on the right hand side bottom, you would realize that there were only these four supports of the square base. And these four supports were filled at the corners, which were called as the pendentives, over which the base of those 40 windows, which is called as a drum, was constructed. And over that drum, the dome was constructed. Okay, So this was a marvel in the Byzantine era where they constructed the world's largest dome without dead walls. Just imagine if there was a 10 feet thick wall, then how would have they been able to do the openings in that 10 feet wall? If the 10 feet wall mein agar wo window, bhi nikalte, to bhi usme se light under eye. Pata. And that is why in the Pantheon, they had given oculus. They had given an opening exactly on the top of the door from where light was coming. They were also worried that if they puncture the wall, would the wall collapse? Because then they were feeling that if the wall is punctured in a Pantheon, if the wall is punctured, then it will become weak and the load of the dome will crush it. But it was in the Byzantine era that they realized that the load does not, can be diverted only to the corners through the drum and hence support needs to be given only at the corners and not the entire wall. And this opened up all the four sides for a church. So this is how the dome, so here uh, on the corners, the brown and uh, blue uh, figures that you are seeing at the corners, just beneath the windows, those are the pendentives. And because of these pendentives, the loads get transferred of the dome, the load gets transferred on the wall. Okay? Now here, um, the rest of the wall that was constructed was not a load-bearing wall. It didn't have any load. So even if they would not have given the wall, the structure would have still stood. So they gave it because they wanted to create more carvings, more arches, more columns. They wanted to create aisles on either side, you know, and that is why they did it. Now, if you see this yellow color, if you see in detail, there is there are different colors that are used in the interiors, in the cladding. So it was a mosaic pattern. I suppose you all know what is a mosaic pattern. Mosaic is, is the broken tile chips, you know, which are stuck together. So there are different colorful tiles, blue, green, yellow, golden, and then beautiful inlay design is done through this. So just imagine the craftsmanship that must have developed when uh, they were making these uh, interiors of the dome and it was looking so very beautiful. Yeah. So, uh, amazingly colored interiors is what you would see here. Now, after this, what happened was uh, for around uh, 1453 AD, so uh, right from the early 353 or whatever era we saw, till 1453, for around 1,000, 1,100 years, uh, the Byzantine Empire ruled very strongly. Justinian's wife, Theodore. So Theodore was also a very dynamic lady. And she was uh, she helped uh, Justinian to maintain all foreign relate, uh, relations with the traders, uh, with the eminent personality. She helped him continuously in his, uh, in his uh, welfare and uh, you know in, in making the rules and regulations and laws for the uh, state so she was uh, a, a very uh, dynamic and uh, what you say uh, a lady who could have definitely earned the throne theodore so uh, after the rule after the rule of justinian at the end uh, of justinian's era the, as he was capturing the Western uh, Roman states also, there were conflicts between the people because, the, as I said, the Western Roman people were not agreeing to the uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Catholic or you know, strategies or thought processes. 
and that is why they were not accepting and there was a lot of revolt and fight whenever there is a revolt and there is no stability in any country that becomes the base for the other countries to invade and this is what happened that in that era somewhere around 1453 ad uh, byzantine saw its fall and that is at the time where the ottoman empire okay the ottoman empire which uh, uh, came took over byzantine and um, the ottoman empire specially belonged to the turkish uh, invaders and the muslim followers so this is the time when hagia sophia they didn't uh, undergo its destruction as such but hagia sophia church was converted to a mosque and currently hagia sophia is a museum so first a church then a mosque so because it was converted to a mosque in the ottoman empire you would see these uh, you would see these uh, symbols that were seen in the hagia sophia pictures you know? so the the church was thus converted to the, the mosque and the minarets that uh, you saw these minarets okay these minarets were constructed later on in the ottoman empire they were not there even the other uh, smaller structures were all constructed as an extension of uh, this church which was converted into a mosque by the ottoman empire it was not there before this is the picture of the final the, how it is a museum right now and that is why when the central dome and the structure was built by byzantine the minarets these pillars which you see these all minarets are the uh, the the tall uh, structures which you see around it are all constructed by the ottoman empire yeah so they were 60 meters 200 feet tall you know so 200 feet tall minarets were added at each corner and it was converted over the centuries the interior was adorned with many elaborate golden mosaics icons decorations but then it was many times it was plastered over also okay so now it is a museum and it is open for tourists around 3.3 million people used to come to see before the covid definitely to see uh, this uh, hagia sophia and uh, we we can say it was the fall of constantinople uh, in 1453 and it was taken over by sultan mehmed ii of the ottoman empire now uh, ottoman empire itself again was a very very robust empire our books don't have anything written on the ottoman empire which is a very very sad state you see all historical books and you would find at least something written on byzantine empire but very short it was always considered as the dark ages which is not so there is a lot of written on christianity as a religion but still it is not written as to what marvel uh, the kings you know constructed in those eras and the next session that we are going to see is on the ottoman empire and there you will come to know that how uh, the sultanate the sultan mehmi and other uh, emperors who preceded sultan mehmed ii built some wonderful similar hagia sophia structures there were different mosques that were constructed and they are amazing so there they look at uh, the golden ratio they look at some intricate details of how to construct it which would be further uh, taken in our next session which is on second of october so this is where the byzantine empire came to an end okay and ottomans uh, reached it means they took over constantinople's ancient land they were fighting for it for around 55 days but because of the unrest within the people and the clashes within their ideologies and things like that it was something which what was had to the, the byzantine empire had to end Uh, so the next session on ottoman empire uh, will be on 2nd october as i said 
Uh, so definitely attend that too. This will complete the uh, the entire architectural construction philosophy of domes and uh, the churches that you see. Where there you will be learning the mosques, but the construction technology is the same. Now, uh, because I started from the ancient, uh, you know, architecture, we will see which were the architectural eras. Just a glimpse of which were the architectural eras after Byzantine and Ottoman. So then comes the Romanesque era. So the Leaning Tower of Pisa comes in the Romanesque era. So after the Dark Ages were over, then you would see these ages, which is the Romanesque architecture, then the Gothic architecture. Okay. Now just see, when we saw the arches of Hagia Sophia and we are seeing the arches over here, you will see such differences. But still, the person who... Uh, invented pendentives, the person who, who realized that walls need not take the weight of the dome or the ceiling was the first genius. Once it is given to you that Haan, ye hum kar sakte hai, then you are able to explore it, which Gothic Renaissance did to the highest level and which we will see. But the initial start of a square structure or a pyramid in Egypt to a dome and arch in the Greek and Roman Empire to a most innovative dome in the Byzantine Empire. These are the forefathers and this knowledge of the forefathers made uh, the uh, modern uh, era architecture possible. So, if whenever we, we tell, we tell uh, the architecture students that you have to learn, you cannot pick up the Hagia Sophia dome and put it on your structure. No, it has its own flaws. It has its own problems. It will not suit the era which you are in. It had a different reason. It had its different limitations for building. Same is with Gothic architecture. You have to understand the need, the material, the construction technique, which your era deserves. What are the local materials? What are the local techniques? What is the space that you want to construct? They constructed the dome not because Pantheon wanted a dome. Pantheon constructed a dome not because we just wanted to innovate it as a different form. No. They were looking for a larger hall space because it was a church, because it was a a gathering uh, place for people, they wanted a hall which didn't have any barrier, which didn't have any barrier in between so that maximum number of people could come. And they wanted it to be so high because it was the God's place. And they wanted it to feel that it is unachievable by humankind. It is unachievable. It cannot be something which, uh, you know, everybody should be able to... Uh, construct or build, it should be one of its kind because it is for the God. And that is why these huge masses and construction was done. Okay. Renaissance. Renaissance was the peak of all these innovations. All these innovations. And then again, with the rise of World War I, World War II, suddenly the, a different architectural style began, which was termed as the modern architecture. So every uh, architectural era has a societal background, has a reasoning for its construction, has a reasoning for why they were doing it. The political, economical, the social background, the religion that the people followed, all this were, all this led to the rise and fall of empires. So the, the uh, zest the, the pride of ruling and becoming one of the most powerful ruler led to building huge empires and also completely destroying them. If you see Alexander, he was the one who destroyed every uh, uh, region which he captured. The, the ancient, the, the prehistoric and the ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian and Persian civilization is all completely devastated by his attacks. So if you attack, you just have to break up 
all the marvels that were constructed just to prove your power. You know, it is a question that we are supposed to ask that whether is this why we are living for? Is this why we are we are we have been given this life just to show that what power you hold, or is it for the humanitarian purpose? The more it is for the humanitarian purpose, the more robust and more enjoyable your uh, life becomes, your society becomes, which is was seen in the stark contrast between the Eastern and Western Roman empires. The same instability, the same corruption, the same uh, you know greed for more, not working, and uh, all these. Uh, leaving taking slaves just being in luxury all this led to its downfall and at the same time byzantine you know? so we there is a story of every era which we need to learn and understand which we will explore in our forthcoming sessions so with that i end uh, this session of today which was the byzantine era what is uh, the time I'm at six seventeen. Okay, it's six seventeen. Okay, so, so we are we are yeah. So we are well in time, right? We are we can still take question answers and we can. If there is any other slide, if there's anything that you have to uh, relook on, just let me. Is there any questions from? Are there any questions from the audience? No, ma'am, no questions yet. But anyone from our participants would like to have any question, you are welcome, most welcome. So, ma'am, there is a question from Vedant Padade. Mm -hmm. So, he states that what are the different prominent Byzantine ruins or impressions over the world we can explore today in the date? Uh, yes, Vedant. Sadly, Byzantine doesn't have uh, that much of an impression as our Roman Gothic Renaissance architecture has had. So how many of you would think of going to Istanbul, right? How many of you, if given a tourist spot, would say, I'll go to Istanbul and, and see Hagia Sophia? No one. Or possibly we architecture students, you know, who feel that, oh, we are slightly understood what is it and we will just go and check. But otherwise, it was a dark age era where uh, it was not explored at all. So there is very less resemblance of um, the Byzantine and Ottoman architecture. Uh, our next speaker for the day, that is, uh, of, of not for the day, on 2nd October, Nisha Mewada, she was one architecture student who was very keenly interested in Byzantine. And she was the one who realized that, oh, there is an Ottoman architecture also. So let me read. When she searched for so many books, when she searched through all libraries, she realized there is hardly anything that is found on Ottoman architecture. So what she did was she researched herself. She went to Istanbul, she stayed there for quite some time and she explored all these monuments which were which are there in Istanbul, right from Hagia Sophia to all the other uh, mosques that were built. And that time the king over there was Mimar Sinan. And Mimar Sinan's mosques, which are the resemblance of Hagia Sophia. And you would, you would not believe, uh, Vedant, that uh, she was saying that the people over there of Istanbul, she, she approached the government of Istanbul and uh, she said, I was uh, allowed to go and uh, see their archives, you know, their museum and what they, and she said they have all documented evidences of uh, India, specifically of Mumbai. There were certain photographs which even we didn't have. You know, those photographs of ancient Mumbai, historical Mumbai, uh, she said those people had archived and documented. And the most important aspect of those uh, Romans was documentation. But because of the rift, because of the world wars, because of, of India, Pakistan, and because of all these religious rifts and partitions, there is not too much of an acceptance 
um, uh, of the of the culture, all all their traditions, all their architecture, which we see from um, Istanbul and which we see from Byzantine. So it is it is very rare that we would find uh, Byzantine, you know, uh, resemblance anywhere over here. That was a good question, Mila. Any other question? I don't think so, ma'am, yet. Okay. No, ma'am. Okay. okay. So is there any other question that uh, you both have to ask? No, ma'am. Every doubt has been cleared uh, during your presentation. Great. Great. Uh, this... Uh, now that uh, we still have time, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So I will just quickly um, brief you on, uh, of course, before we leave from here uh, or after we leave from here, I would also like you to go and visit uh, a short uh, documentary on Hagia Sophia so that you would be taken and uh, a live uh, video through um, Hagia Sophia. Uh, by the time we are explaining, I think Madhura, if you get a short uh, video on Hagia Sophia, we would be glad if we can see all of us can see it together. Uh, just let us know if it is okay. possible for you to fetch. Okay, a, a small five to seven minutes video on the on Hagia Sophia specifically. Okay, so uh, before uh, Madhura fetches this video, we will see this uh, book. You know the the book which I. Uh, told to you about, uh, which is uh, the Dan Brown, uh, the Da Vinci Code. So I will be to see. Yeah. Right? The Da Vinci Code. So this is, this is, uh, that this book was, uh, is a thriller, is a suspense thriller. Those who are good uh, readers uh, and who are interested in reading books, you must read Danny Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, here they have not only explored Leonardo da Vinci, so it was uh, uh, majorly mentioned in the books that uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a homosexual. But uh, uh, more than being homosexual, which is which is not being proven in any case, he had a very strong belief in equality in men and women. He had a very strong belief where. Uh, man and woman are given the equal weightage. Okay, So uh, if you see um, uh, Mona Lisa painting, right? if you see Mona Lisa, uh, you would realize that when you, when you take, when you see Mona Lisa in, in, in a perspective, in, in, a, in a proper way, one side of Mona Lisa, on, uh, out of the left and right side, one side of Mona Lisa has, uh, has a different uh, depth to the painting more than the other side, the background of Mona Lisa. This, this indicates that uh, he was trying to build in um, a balance between the feminine and masculine aspects of, uh, of the universe. And the pagan system, which I was talking of, also believes in this. So it why was it giving the authority to the womanhood is because she was the one one who was who will be who, who was who gives birth okay? and because of that uh, the woman is is supposed to be on a higher pedestal and she is worshipped was the ideology it was later that patriarchy came so this book in a very wonderful uh, story form uh, tries to give uh, this idea of how uh, pagan system thought uh, how the religion behind the pagan system was and how uh, different other uh, religions which came are idol worship, are patriarchal. Very interesting. And then you can drive parallels from your own religion. You can drive parallels from what we are believing in today and it can be really a, a question to come. So this is one interesting. It was definitely read, read Dan Brown. 
Yeah. Madhura, uh, are you able to fetch it? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll just present my screen. Yeah. Ma'am? Yes. Uh, ma'am, you have to stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to stop sharing. I suppose somebody's video is on. See here, we are not able to see the half tones. Right? We are just able to see the main board. Yes, ma'am. No, you can continue. I'll just. Uh, okay, ma'am. Because there is no sound, I am just giving an input. Okay, ma'am. You can keep playing. These are the windows. Look at the huge massiveness and see the interiors. See the mosaic work, the detailing. Though the columns are plain, the columns are not decorated much. But Nine hundred years later, there was the Cathedral of, of Florence. So the another dome after this uh, Hagia Sophia is uh, the dome of Florence. Uh, but it is almost after nine hundred years. Till then, the Dark Ages had continued. There was not much construction in architectural model. It was after the Dark Ages that this is all the interiors. You can see how well it is lit up just because the walls are not that thick. This is the... Yes. Thank you, Udira. Yeah. So the apps uh, that was there, which was uh, formed where initially the idol was. Now he is saying that because it's a mosque and while praying, uh, they have to face the Mecca, uh, which is their main center of, uh, of all the religious embodiment. They have to face the Mecca and that's why uh, they have shifted it slightly from the center is what they are saying. Right. So if uh, there are no more questions, then I think we can conclude the session. Okay, ma'am. Is, yeah, Ronak is asking what is the story behind Hagia Sophia and the mosque? Mm, well, the story is only of the, uh, the religious beliefs of uh, 
the emperors that time so constantine was a very strong follower of christianity and he was the one who was uh, wanting to spread christianity uh, to the maximum so when he became the emperor then he got the entire freedom of doing so and christianity became one of the most popular uh, religions and people had to accept so um, when when it comes to christianity when it comes to religion following it comes to idol worship when it comes to idol worship it comes to jesus christ when it comes to jesus christ it comes to a place of religious uh, you know uh, prayer hall where everybody has to gather and the idol is worship now earlier right from the egyptian era it was always that the structures were built focusing on the uh, religion the belief in religion and the um, palaces so these were the two structures which all the um, uh, the money the uh, the power the the labor was poured in because that showed the the king's identity that showed how strong the king is how powerful the king is so hagia uh, hagia sophia was made so the best of the craftsmen the best best of the innovators the best of the construction specialists uh, maximum uh, money was all poured in to make that uh, monument and uh, it is nothing but a uh, uh, but a, a religious abode of the almighty that's it which it took us on the right way to get uh, us to know all you of the present era uh, we would really appreciate uh, your efforts for explaining us this great era into an amazing way thanks a lot ma'am so uh, after this influential byzantine era of the classical age as we experienced it today Uh, there was the birth of an another uh, slant era also known as the ottoman era which left uh, some of the prominent features uh, and the uh, stories uh, back to us so on the next part uh, we will be experiencing an another prominent era yes ma'am uh, this was an intro for our uh, the next session which has been happening on the 2nd of october so it will be great to see you all over there right thank you very much uh, also questions are all welcome so in case you have any questions we had a live uh, youtube uh, floating also so we will check if there are any other questions over there and uh, we have our i think we have our gmail id uh, yes ma'am huh? it's yeah. activity activity skltco at the gmail.com i'll be also putting it up uh, into the chat box so if you have yeah. uh, any doubts or any question which you get after the session ends so you can mail us over there we'll try our best to reach you out right right so uh, there are our students who would be preparing and working on uh, hagia sophia as an as a part of their uh, uh, syllabus activity so and they also will be doing some presentations on some specific parts so if any of you would like to uh, get uh, further information you can contact on the same email id and we can share it with you. Okay, so on that note, I think we will conclude, right? Kunal, Sai, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. Bye, bye. Then see you on thank second you, of October with the Nisha. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Thank you ma'am